this is a fascinating topic. And when Jesse and I started looking into it, we really started thinking about how this affects students and what they approach your courses with. And that has changed since many of us were also students. So keeping in mind, even though some of this may horrify you, which many of Jesse and I's selections are to say, hey, this might be happening and you might not know it. It's to kind of reorient how we organize our classrooms and how we approach students and how we have honest conversations about making sure that they're getting the true learning out of your content instead of just looking at how do I get the best grade? And so we're gonna explore a lot of that today. So our learning outcomes, what are the consumerism implications behind dishonesty? So many students probably without these alternate forces may not be tempted. And so figuring out what are the strategies that we use to make that a less important driver in the classroom is going to be critical. And then we'll be able to articulate how you wanna develop transparency and community with effective communication. We can talk about these tough topics with our students. We can talk with them about this type of demographic or this kind of situation in your student life might contribute to these temptations. So let's work on making sure that that doesn't play a part in your decision making. So in the references, you'll see a lot of the books and the articles that we pulled from. But as an overview, we want our honor codes to not just include what are the restrictions, you can't cheat, you can't plagiarize, but also to have a general requirement and a, an ethos of sincerity. We want you to learn, we want you to turn in your best work, we want you to get the research right. And so a lot of this presentation um, is also going to help us remember that talking to our students about that is critical. I hope they assume that, but it's a good conversation to include in the classroom. So there's a lot of science to cheating. Some of the first science um, began with the article, The Science of Cheating, a, Psycholo a Psychologist Perspective, and this was by Benjamin Lovett. And cheating has been studied since about 1938. So when we really dug into the research, there was a ton of it. So part of what we want to outline today is what that research was then. Most of these things like the motivations haven't progressed. They are the same, but some of the other incentives in this consumerism have made this an even more complex problem. So we'll look at the science of it all the way through what we know to be the incentives right now. So what we know first is there's a difference between the cheating that occurs in a classroom setting, like looking at another student's test and plagiarism, which is a little bit less researched. So plagiarism has a little bit more of sometimes of a plantfulness, sometimes not. We know a lot of this can also be related in a classroom to anxiety and some classroom environmental things that can occur. But when we look at the motivation for cheating, we look at competition. And when we ask students, what do you think are the motivations? What are the top reasons that students cheat? In addition to procrastination, which ends up being one of the main reasons, it's competition. It's that they didn't feel like they had time to adequately prepare. And that can be a time management issue or a student you know, may be raising a child. They may have another job. So some of those are predictable and some of those are not. Difficult assignments. And so it's just too deep and the student may not have planned enough time to prep or a lack of interest in the course and the material. In a lot of our presentations that we do for CTE and for this particular certificate of completion, we talk about the fact the lack of interest in the course and the material is not usually tied to why students don't speak in class. So it's not listed in the article as fourth as in the least important, but a lot of the other research that is complementary to this makes us think that that could very likely be it. So if we stop here on the side and look at what are the opportunities as faculty then to counter this temptation and should that be your job? No. Do we want that to be your job? No. Can we do that? Yes. So if we want to counter based on what students self-report as their justifications for cheating and those have limitations, we can find fault in them, but that's not going to help us. So if we look at how we as instructors charge to us, 
taking pains to present your assignments as fair and meaningful, organizing the tasks into a workload that's reasonable. So if students getting three course you know, credit hours for a course, we really should be giving about that. So talking to them about that. So this might take nine hours. This might take five hours per week. Know that from the first day, know that going in. So on day one or on day two, explain to your students how much reading you're gonna be assigning and how much time students should expect to devote to that reading. So be very clear about which weeks might also require more time investment from them. And if you're grading on a curve, this is, you know, a very old pedagogical kind of way to do it. But think about the fact that that is then kind of increasing the likelihood of competition. And what we have looked at here is competition for good grades is a motivation. And so we may be unintentionally setting students up to go, oh, my gosh, I know that this is an honors class. I know that I'm a sophomore and mostly juniors are in this class. What are the things that we're unintentionally doing? So if you grade on a curve, it may be worth it to really take some reflection on how they may be benefiting or not benefiting, especially if that's one of your sole methods of grading is doing tests that also are graded on a curve. So other correlations and then how to counter them. So when we looked at Isaac and Whitley, they found certain demographics are also more associated with cheating. Now, before I go through these, please know we should never use demographic variables to suspect students of cheating. But as we're looking through the lens of the types of students that are in your course, who might be more likely? That falls to being a male, having a full-time job. And these go right back to some of the things that are on this slide belonging to a fraternity or sorority, and those two mostly are because of time limitations, and more upperclassmen than freshmen cheat, and more older students within a certain class. So if you have a 20-year-old sophomore, that person may be more likely than a 19-year-old sophomore or a younger person in the same class to cheat. So we would never use that, but you can see how it goes back to amount of time, upperclassmen, sometimes that falls back to the competition and getting close to graduation. So the nice thing is, is that we're not going, oh my gosh, these are bad people. These are people who have more incentive and incentives that we can meet directly. So what do we do with that? When you're in your course, you can say, how many of you are working full time? Okay, now we're gonna be more planful about you planning out your study time because you have less study time than other people. That can incentivize people who would never otherwise cheat to cheat because you run out of time. Spending the last 10 minutes of class figuring out how they're gonna plan for the test studying or the completion of an assignment or especially a major one. So making those test preparation activities part of your course time. So if you were to give students the study guide in the last 15 minutes, the week before the class, let them work together on answering the questions to the study guide. You have wiped away these additional incentives. So let them know how many of you are close to graduation. If you have three quarters of the class that graduate that semester, that's an indicator to you. Okay, now we wanna be sure that you are getting the most out of this course and you're not rushing at the end. What are the things that you all need in order for us to be able to help you know the most when you're going into one of your courses? A lot of students, we see that they cheat because there's an unfair, overly difficult assignment. If students feel like you don't care, which Jesse and I saw a drastic increase in academic integrity allegations during COVID, I think because students felt so disconnected. So if they didn't see their instructor, they didn't hear from their instructor, which doesn't mean that you don't care. It was COVID. They just felt like, you know what? Nobody's really watching. So why don't I go ahead and cheat? So if you're saying, I know that this can be a problem, I know you're under extreme pressure, I know you're about to graduate, I know that that can cause people to do things they would normally do, and that you're working full time, let's look at what we can do to prevent that from becoming a factor in the choices that you make. Then psychological traits are also somewhat stronger correlates of cheating than the demographics. So now we add another layer onto this. Students who are motivated by grades, you know which those students might be in your class. And 
we're going to look back at why students may be more motivated by grades than by true learning. And a lot of that is sociological and the system of education. Students who feel alienated or dissatisfied with school, that goes to what I was just speaking about. If they feel like teachers don't care what they get, they're not getting what they expected for their money, all of those fall into, then what's the point of really getting into this? And students with higher levels of anxiety about their academic performance. This keeps them from going, I can't wait to learn everything I want to learn about microbiology because it's fascinating to me. Like, what do I need to learn for the test? We want students to know we care about their mastery of knowledge and skills. So this is critical, telling them that I care about your mastery of this knowledge. If you feel like it's getting to a point where there's too much information on this test, maybe that will also make students go, okay, I just need to master what I think is going to be on the test and not necessarily the material that is overall most important. And so that's sort of the, the science of cheating. Um, but as we kind of narrow um, and focus specifically on a certain type of cheating that has evolved um, in the past decade or two at this point, contract cheating. So Clark and Lancaster define contract cheating as the submission of work by students or for academic credit, which the students have paid contractors to write for them. And so essentially it's the outsourcing of work through paid services or tutors online. And so that can look many different ways, whether that's your essay mills where you're asking someone to write a paper for you, or maybe outsourcing specific companies as well to take an exam for you, answer questions, things of that nature. And so contract cheating continues to become even more popular as technology advances and as I mentioned, there's a wide range of different assignments and things that can be completed. And so later in the presentation, we'll talk about how we can design those assignments to kind of circumvent this issue of contract cheating. And ultimately, it can be commercially or non-commercially um, outsourced. And so commercially, of course, is going to be a corporation or a company that exists online that has a website, they offer different prices for things that they're offering to students. And they're also very intentional in their language and marketing to capture the attention of our students. And then non-commercially is going to be someone that they know. It could be a friend or a family member who they have trusted to be able to do their assignment for them. So if it's a friend who maybe has already taken the class before, they may pay that individual to assist them with their assignment. Or if it's a family member, they may ask that family member to assist them. So a major part of contract cheating, while it can be something of a monetary value for the non-commercial aspect, it could just be, you know, doing a favor for another individual. It doesn't always have to be in exchange for um, something of value. And so there's a cool book that was released last summer, I believe, and it's the complete guide uh, to contract cheating, but really it starts to break down how this has really become a major business for some individuals. And so it's written by someone who used to be a ghost writer who was actively involved in sort of that underworld of contract cheating. But this individual has now turned to a whistleblower in terms of detailing their experiences with working in this industry and how lucrative it, it can be. And so he, of course, was a part of an essay mill service where students continuously outsourced him to complete writing assignments. And yeah, for nearly a decade, that's what he did in a wide range, as you can see here, essays, papers, capstone projects, theses, and even doctoral dissertations. And so I think what's most interesting about the book and what he writes about is he has dealt with students from every sort of walk of life and from one end of the spectrum to another. So you're incoming freshman all the way to maybe, you know, middle-aged or a very experienced person in their careers who are looking to obtain a doctoral degree. And so that goes back to what Elisa was just mentioning about there isn't necessarily a set demographic to identify who's likely to engage in cheating, especially contract cheating. However, it does kind of make you wonder that students who are adult learners who have jobs and families, they are just as susceptible to this issue as well because of all the psychological things that they're going through in their life, but also their level of involvement with 
how they can dedicate their time to their studies, but also everything in their personal lives. So the economics of academic dishonesty, there are three main factors that have kind of been identified when we think about um, the economics and what may factor into a decision to engage in this behavior. So time, time is a, um, a finite resource because we only have so much time in a day. And so if we're thinking about our students who um, have jobs or are involved in extracurricular activities or are part of organizations or have families or maybe are in the military, you know, those are a lot of different things. And so how we dedicate our time is going to be different from student to student. And so time is not always equal for everyone. And so those who have other obligations and commitments can sometimes be at a disadvantage because of how they are forced to have to compartmentalize their time. And so an understanding of market forces serve as a motivator for students to engage in academic dishonesty. And a major part of it is going to be the reason why students decide um, to pursue higher education in the first place. And that's usually to obtain that marketable um, diploma where that will set them up for career advancement and um, hopefully earnings to go in the future. So money is playing a major part um, in the economics of that. There have been numerous studies in the past few decades about the future of liberal arts and students pursuing careers away from that and maybe looking more towards STEM and business and engineering, you know, computer science, because those are the career fields that are very prevalent right now and seem to be um, the ones that have a high opportunity for um, salaries coming out of um, college. And so students are keeping that in mind and they are going with majors that they feel like will allow them um, to maximize their career earnings um, over their lifespan. And then ultimately the rewards of academic dishonesty. I'll be frank with you all that uh, while I don't rationalize a behavior, if we really take a, a step back and look at it from the student's perspective, if I am working maybe an eight hour shift and I still have assignments that need to get done and I'm trying to be efficient and maximize my time, contract cheating may look like a great option and something that makes the most sense because I can still split what I'm doing. I can still go to my job and earn my money because, you know, if I have bills or I have other things, I may need to do that. But I can also still outsource that work and make sure that the assignment is getting done simultaneously. So now I've sort of achieved two things. And one, I've still been able to go to work and, you know, earn a paycheck, but I also am getting my assignments done um, through the outsourcing of other individuals completing it. And then also keeping in mind, job opportunities can be impacted sometimes by a student's ability to have high test scores and GPA, which we'll talk a little bit more about how the educational system has kind of built this societal norm where academic dishonesty seems like a reasonable uh, decision for students. And if any of you have ever listened to the audiobook Why I Hate the Ivy League by Malcolm Gladwell, he kind of mocks one of our Supreme Court justices who's speaking to a classroom of law students who are not in the Ivy League. And so one of the students said, if I'm a go-getter and I really want to try to have a clerkship with the Supreme Court, who, what are you looking for? And he looks them dead in the eye and is like, oh, we only hire from the Ivy League. I can't afford to have anything but the best. So here are these top 1% students who are law students are being told, if you're not in the Ivy League, um, then you don't have a chance at all. So these messages are just replayed and replayed and replayed. Further, looking at some of the sociological and some of the system reasons why this happens, product versus process. So one of our great authors argues that the No Child Left Behind age contributed. So No Child Left Behind was signed by Bush in 2002 and it was supposed to bring all students up to a proficient level on state tests by 2013, 2014. So initially it's meant to kind of close the competitive achievement gap between some minority students, poor students, students who had English as a second language. 
and their peers and all of this has good intention behind it you know it's a civil rights issue business leaders appreciated it because there was a perception we were falling behind other countries but whether people predicted that or not at the time is we all know that now many public schools and many of this is now attached to their funding are teaching to the test so they're grading the scores and not looking at what that particular school's um, needs or what they don't have that other schools have. So this has become kind of this huge driver for how schools teach. And our students in elementary school up are now getting these messages that this is what you have to do. You have to get a certain score on this test. So that's something that's been drilled into them since elementary school. Secondly, the getting what you pay for it, which Jesse has kind of alluded to, there really is a perception that if you go to the top school, that you are more marketable. That if you are looking at the top program at the top school, that's how you choose. It's not about fit. It's not about where you may excel. It isn't always about people are going to give our students the advice of going to the top tier, even if, and we see this on the care team, a student may really do better going closer to home. That might be better for their mental health. That might be better for their first year and their transition. But the message is vastly different than what's actually good for you. And assignments, you know, becoming transactional. And so if we think about that, even myself teaching University 101, sometimes you can fall into that trap of assigning different things for students to complete. And is it a situation where we assign it, they submit it, and that's it. And there is nothing to build off of the assignment or any additional sort of things. And so sometimes students may feel like the work is becoming more tedious or monotonous, especially if it's a writing assignment. And so if we're thinking about viewing it as economic rather than intellectual, you know, what Ritter in 2005 is saying is, yeah, it's completely transactional where I submit this, you give me an A, and that's sort of the dynamic that works through rather than you're writing, you're completing this writing assignment, um, again, to display your level of knowledge and skills that you've obtained in this class, and you're applying something that maybe um, we discussed in class or a reading um, or something that I had you all research. And so autonomy is a, another piece of this, and we'll continue to discuss that. but definitely the transactional nature of assignments in higher education can contribute to sort of the enterprise of it all. And then lastly, essay mills and the different services that are available online, they're very clever. And that's because these are also individuals who have a college degree. And so whether that's in business, marketing, or maybe public relations, or even psychology, those are different fields that understand maybe how the human brain works and how we can entice and attract the specific audience that we're looking for for as cons consumers um, and as customers. And so essay mills and these different services, I think of it as no different than maybe retail companies or food industries or whatever it may be. Everyone's going to have specific marketing strategies that they utilize to attract their audience. And so the essay mills, what they utilize is exploiting the weaknesses of students. And so a great example of an advertisement that is available online, Papers Owl, is one of the essay mills. So as we look at why their language for why students should choose them for their services, one being the privacy. So they're already emphasizing and sort of the privacy aspect of it of if you go through services with our company, you don't have to worry about us sharing your information, you will remain confidential. And so again, this is sort of a, a secrecy thing here. And so that's really assuring to students that, okay, none of this will come back and backfire on me because you're assuring my safety and my privacy throughout this entire process. So that's already making the student feel safe and comfortable with doing this. Even if it's their first time, they now feel a little better about it because they have this company assuring them that there's a full privacy policy. 
And then moving on to the next part, they employ over 500 writers with only the highest ratings and great testimonials and many years of writing experience. So if I'm thinking about outsourcing my work, I also want to be assured that I am having someone that knows what they're doing. They're a competent and strong writer because why else would I spend my money if it's going to be low quality work? So they're really building off of that factor that they provide nothing but the best of service and the best writers all over the world. Plagiarism free. So again, we're hitting on the fact that not only will this transaction be private, but there won't be any possibility that you will get in trouble with your institution for possible plagiarism because you know we're double checking it it's green through and again we have strong writers who are writing original academic papers and so that plagiarism is not something that you should be concerned about because they are brand new freshly written content and then lastly the on-time delivery and for especially for the students that fall victim to contract cheating the most I think this is very important because as we talk about time being a finite resource, if you're telling a student that you can meet strict deadlines with a quick turnaround, that's probably the factor that plays the biggest part in it. And there are a lot of websites that I've explored just playing around with and seeing what they're capable of doing. And most of them, if I had a 20 page paper that's due by 11.59 tonight, a lot of the websites, they're capable and they assure you that they can have that done by 1159. Now, of course, the cost becomes a little bit more higher based upon the turnaround time and the number of pages that need to be written, but they do truly let you know that they are capable of getting that assignment done. So if we're thinking about a student who maybe has procrastinated or not managed their time well and a deadline has snuck up on them, rather than taking that zero, as you know, people may have done in the past, SA Mills have now allowed it very feasible that you can still get that assignment submitted in a timely manner and not having to take that zero. And so they've mastered that approach of the persuasive language to appeal to the students' needs and welfare. And these are individuals who understand the current state of higher education and they understand the demographic and they understand Generation Z and all of the different things that come in. And so even marketing can be available in different platforms such as TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, because they understand that that's where the traditional age college student is. And so they're meeting them where they are to be able to share this information. So if you ever pay attention, you will never see marketing maybe on TV as a commercial, right? Because most of Generation Z probably isn't watching cable, but they're streaming, they're online. And so that's where you're going to find these different companies to elicit their services. Developing intellectual autonomy. Um, and so this is going to be on the students end um, in terms of how we're able to capture their attention and help them take ownership of their learning. The autonomy implies development of skills of reflection and analysis, so i.e. metacognitive abilities, so that a student could plan, monitor, and finally evaluate his or her own uh, progress. And so just thinking about that first part of the quote there, intellectual autonomy, that's going to be one of the first things you can do before you can get students to buy in. As Gina was mentioning, you know, if we want students to really be invested in the learning and really look at assignments and exams and different things within the course as an opportunity to display their learning and their knowledge, we first have to have their intellectual autonomy and capture that first. And then they will kind of lead the way in taking ownership of their learning. And so development of uh, metacognition and then the reflective management and learning. And then lastly, success drives the intrinsic motivation. Too often our students are allowing the extrinsic motivation to be their sort of their driving force in being a student. And so oftentimes that will lead to them being uh, reported to our office because the extrinsic motivation is maybe making their parents proud because their parents wanted them to be a law student. And so that's why they want to go to law school. Or maybe their parent wants them to be a doctor. So they decided to major in public health because of that reason, but they're not actually invested in public health for themselves. 
or maybe they're just focused on the end goal, which is the grade part, but skipping the whole journey ahead of that, which is the actual learning and retaining of information. And so that's how we sort of start out by creating that buy-in is developing the intellectual autonomy um, for the student. And then here are some pedagogical approaches um, towards um, intellectual autonomy. Um, so implementing inquiry-based learning, which basically all this is incorporating deeper questions and facilitated dialogue within your course for those responses for students to really become critical thinkers and to analyze specific information that's being covered in the class. And so we're moving away from the typical, let's just test you on what you know or what you remember, um, but actually moving forward to real life context and solutions um, regarding that discipline. So maybe if you're teaching a math class, um, it's not always just going over how to solve equations and how to follow these steps um, to answer um, a question and maybe moving towards actual practical real life um, examples um, that require students to have a deeper level of thinking. So inquiry-based learning, that's something that has been around for a long time, but that's just one aspect to moving towards intellectual autonomy. Asking students to write in first person to verbalize their opinions of what they think. Too many times I think students are providing the answer, answers that they think the professor wants to hear, which while that may be true for some assignments, also take the time to allow them to write from their perspective of what their opinions or viewpoints are on certain topics. Because again, now we're allowing them to have autonomy and choices over the assignment and we're able to kind of tweak and cater it to the individual in certain instances. Incorporating peer review, because again, that allows students to take responsibility for their own learning. And they're also being able to sort of assess themselves and over scaling with their peers, but we're not creating a competitive environment with that. We're just doing peer reviews to allow students to, again, take pride in their work. And I will say even for most of us who have been students at some point, I think there is a higher level of effort and attention and detail that goes into assignments. You know, your peers are gonna be the ones looking over it because no one wants to create subpar work when they know their peers are gonna be the individuals who are assessing that. And then scaffolding major assignments. Again, that holds students accountable, which Dr. Whitener will talk a little bit about, but it's low stakes, right? And so if we're thinking about a major project or portfolio, we're breaking that into smaller chunks. So for the students who have jobs, who have major time commitments, they're not looking at trying to complete a 12 hour project in one week, but rather those 12 hours are sparse and maybe separated throughout the semester. And you're doing timely check-ins to make sure that students are staying on track and their assignment is actually meeting the criteria of what your rubric and what you will be grading them on. And then make test preparation activities a part of students' grades. So if you're gonna review before a major exam, you know, allow that to be a part of a student's grade. So whether that's doing in-class activities or having them submit things such as their notes that they're taking or maybe some sort of study guide that they've created on their own. Those are practical things which, one, allows it to be a low stakes grade where students are earning credit, but it's also incentivizing studying now because they're able to earn a few points just by creating their own little study guide to help them prepare for the exam. Now it becomes less of an issue whether students have studied or not because you will know that going in because they've kind of completed this assignment. And then at what cost academic dishonesty um, and sort of the economics of it all play a part. So if we're thinking about students in the 11th hour at night and they have an assignment that's due, also think about the traditional college age student, they're risk takers developmentally. And if we understand how the brain works, frontal cortex, they're often gonna make rash decisions and they're thinking in the moment, but not necessarily what's to come. And so they can't see those consequences consequences of their immediate actions because they're simply thinking if I outsource this work right now, I can get the assignment submitted and everything will be taken care of because I've met the deadline and my work has been completed. However, not thinking about the future implication of, okay, 
What happens if I'm reported to the Office of Academic Integrity? What are the consequences of that? How may that impact my academic career here at the University of South Carolina? But also, how could it impact um, my career going forward professionally you know, after I finish college if I'm not necessarily taking the time to learn this information and to complete the assignments that help to evaluate that I know the content? And so discuss it with students how to navigate situations of desperation because it will inevitably arise at some point in the semester where they may be pressed for time or they may be anxious or stressed, overwhelmed um, because of everything that's going on. And so I've coined the term with my students taking the L, standing for a loss, take the loss, take the zero. And basically that stands for, I mean, live to fight another day. You know, if we're looking at the breakdown of the class and it's a quiz that maybe is 5% or something like that, Will it hurt to take the zero on that rather than potentially having an honor code violation and having to meet with our office? And then now there are more implications that would have came from just taking the zero and it's a snowball effect. And so having those conversations early and often with students to talk about how we can work around those desperate situations or how you wanna communicate with that with the professors, those are helpful for students because especially for first year students, they're coming from high school where they're completely oblivious to some things or ignorant to some things. And they may, there's always that perception that I will never find myself in this situation. However, if you're in college long enough, everyone will maybe procrastinate on an assignment and have a, an assignment deadline that sneaks up on them. And so how do they handle those situations when they arise? And then disincentivizing a focus on grades. And so as Elisa mentioned earlier, the whole idea of grading on a curve. If we think about that, not only does that create a competitive nature that incentivizes students to want to engage in academic dishonesty, it's also um, not equitable. Um, and so for those of you who may be unfamiliar with grading on a curve, it's basically a bell curve, right? So there's a certain number of A's um, and B's that a professor uh, may award to students and then C's and D's um, to follow out as well. And so if we're thinking about the students who are doing their assignments honestly with integrity, they are at a disadvantage because although they're trying their hardest and maybe producing high quality work, if it's not as good as what the contract cheating services are providing, now those students aren't able to earn an A in that class and they've now been bumped down to maybe a B or B minus all because of grading on a curve and there's only a certain number of A's that are gonna be awarded. And so this cool article that was written, basically the author creates an analogy towards is cheating and playing the game, um, a sport. And so yet while these students think they're keeping their eyes on the ball, they are actually just staring at the scoreboard. And I love this quote because I coach basketball in my free time. And so that's a major thing that I encourage my players not to do is play the game and don't look at the scoreboard after every single basket is scored. Focus on the actual game and what's going on in front of you um, because while you're focused on the score, you're not actually paying attention to what I'm asking you to do or the strategies um, that I'm trying to implement um, for the game plan. And so if we're thinking about an academic environment, students keeping their eyes on what the specific grade is, is taking away focus from the actual game of learning and the focus of the class, the learning outcomes and the objectives of the course and what you are hoping that they take away from it. And so if students can redirect their focus from the scoreboard to the game of learning, an interesting thing happens and they create a direct relationship between input and outcome. And that's how we know that students are more invested. We have captured that intellectual autonomy because now it's more so mastery and not just the outcome of their grades. And then building a preventative community. So we can assess students' expe expectations, goals, and motivations and concerns just by having conversations. And this can also be a quick assignment at the beginning of the semester just to gauge why students are taking your class, what they hope to get out of it, and what's going to motivate them you know, throughout the entirety of the semester. And what are some of their concerns um, that they have, especially if students have kind of research and students talk to each other so they're aware of what's going on around campus and they may know okay this history class has traditionally been a tough class 
for sophomore students. You know, what are their concerns? Are, have they heard about how tough your exams are? Have, have they heard about the amount of reading that you assign? Help to gauge that early on so that you can console that and you can address those concerns early on and let them know, hey, if you're dedicating time, if you're doing these things, communicating office hours, you'll be just fine in this class. Offer transparency by expressing your expectations, whether implicit or um, explicit. And so, again, that's going to be participation. That's going to be showing up to class, not just being there, but being actively engaged in the course, communicating, and then what are your expectations for assessments as well. Cultivate peer-to-peer -peer relationships through activities such as study groups, group assignments, and open discussions. So that is paramount to how you're building that community in class where students are able to engage with each other. And it's not always just a student to professor relationship, but they have actual buy-in because they're actively involved with each other's learning. And so the peer reviews that I mentioned on a previous slide would also fall under this category as well. And then being adaptive to change in response to what students' connection is to the material. And so if you've identified that there are some weaknesses and students aren't necessarily catching on to the content as well, you can shift your pedagogical practices and your methods that you're using for the class to sort of fit what that class needs at the time. And every semester is going to be different. And, and certainly as the years go on, college students are coming into college with varying levels of preparedness for higher education. And so how we are able to address that is being able to make on the fly adjustments and maybe if there's a certain way that you're used to teaching the class, there may have to be some adaptations that you make in order to help students be successful and also, again, to encourage that intellectual autonomy. And then make cheating not worth the risk. So explain the, the cost of it, very transparent and upfront about it. So if there's an honor code violation, these are the potential implications. This is what the grade penalty may look like. And so help to explain to students why that's not a reasonable option and what they can do as an alternative to that. The other ways, the article from Murdoch, there is three strategies that they recommend that every instructor can do about making cheating not worth the risk and the, looking at the cost benefit or the economic options is to also make sure that you're explicit and obvious. You do not want to have to turn somebody in for an honor code violation, but that if there is a suspicion, it isn't personal and that you will be um, referring to the Office of Academic Integrity. That alone, um, and knowing that there's an enforcement component in your class, can affect um, behaviors. Also, make it easy to detect using geography. If you can space students out, please, please, please do that. Arrange the seats so that they are not close together. If you have an auditorium, there are ways to arrange seats if it's not a packed auditorium, and so that you can walk in between and see the papers. So the third one is this critical is get out of the front of the room. Make sure to keep rotating around, have TAs rotate around. So um, Murdoch, who writes this article again, says he usually goes around with one eyebrow lifted, just a kind of half smile to let students know I really am paying attention because this is very important to me. And so now we have Dr. Casey Whitener, who will kind of walk us through a great sort of living example of what this may look like in a class. And so we're very fortunate to have um, her be able to explain um, the personal achievement plan that she's incorporated um, in her course. Hi, Jesse. Hi, Elisa. Hi, everybody else. Forgive me for joining a little bit late. I'm just in between classes. The personal achievement plan I've incorporated into all of my classes is a supplement to the syllabus. So it begins at the beginning of the semester. I give them a menu of options, ways that they can achieve the necessary scores and points to get the grade that they desire in the class. <clears throat> and then I ask them to figure out exactly how they're going to do it. So it's on them to go through the syllabus and, and well, I mean, we'll go through it together as a class, right? But then they get a chance to really do a deep dive into what each of these options are and then create for themselves their own deadlines and their own strategies for how they expect to do the work. So in my syllabus, I've got three categories of work. One category is a personal um, project that they have to work on on their own. And there's a whole menu of these things. They're able to do things like uh, podcast breakdown, 
or they can do um, a dig deeper where they go and research a particular concept in the class, or they have a business and art option where they can go and look at how business is affecting the art or how business is being portrayed in art, watching videos, watching movies, reading books, things like that. But anyway, I have a whole menu of things they can do for their personal individual work and they get to set their own deadline for that. Then there's a category of engagement work. This is mostly online chats, so online discussion forums, where those are prompts every single week, and they'll want to go in there and respond to the prompts and respond to their classmates, and they can earn points that way to demonstrate engagement. And then the third part of it is a group project that they'll participate in in some capacity, and that project also has a plan. And then we have uh, milestones for the plan, and we have to check in about midterm. That's what I'm doing this week, actually, is midterm check-ins. And then at the end, they present their uh, semester-long project. So these three categories of work and the, the three equal weights to those three categories means that two-thirds of their work is based on their own individual effort, and one-third of it is part of that group project where they're applying the concepts that we're learning and they have to determine in their personal achievement plan how they expect to earn those engagement points how they expect to uh, complete that choice work assignment and then what their expectations are for the group project as well and what i found is that it creates for them personal accountability uh, as an individual, they're able to look at their own schedule, look at their own semester, and try to figure out when they have time to do extra work, when they don't think they're going to have time to do extra work. They also have to think about things like if they're going to be going away for study abroad over spring break, or if they're going to be working at the master's tournament where they miss a full week of school, like these other things that kind of take them out of the classroom. They may miss out on some of those engagement opportunities, so they have to schedule their engagement points in different ways based on whether or not they're going to be available in the class classroom to be able to earn it. And so this achievement plan gets turned in at the very beginning of the semester, and then we get it back at the end of the semester as a personal achievement plan reflection. And what they'll do is take the original plan they submitted and then look through it and reflect on whether or not the plan went the way they expected it to, or where they ran into trouble, places where they were a little more ambitious than they probably should have been, things like that. And they get a lot out of those reflection assignments. I, I typically see most of the growth in that reflection assignment at the end where they think about and I, I get a lot of feedback about how the course was designed for them to be in control and some of them love that and some of them hate it <laughs> some of them are really frustrated by the fact that the stumbling blocks or the challenges or the places where they fell short are entirely on them because they're the ones that built their own deadlines they're the ones that selected their own work um, they are in control of their own destiny and because of that um, they have a sense of personal responsibility toward the end uh, it doesn't completely change the the grade complaints that all of us get <laughs> at the end but it does at least give me some documentation that says hey look you said you were going to do it this way and then you didn't and, and that's on you so it's worked out for me uh, i use this in all of my classes i teach business classes here at the darla moore school um, and it's been a really effective way to get students to own their own experience uh, to have a sense of what success is going to look like and then to really measure their progress toward that success thank you for that dr whitener and that's the end of our presentation but yeah thank you again as always dr whitener sharon and nate appreciate you all for having us and this was a successful session.